Live from TK's American Cafe on White Street, this is the Danbury Hattricks Coaches Panel. I'm broadcaster Doug Latuka with our Danbury Hattricks coaching staff. We've got four coaches on the panel tonight in our inaugural coaches panel. We're very excited for it. Thanks so much for joining us live here at TK's American Cafe and a little bit of a quiet night, Wednesday night. You got a TNT doubleheader. You also have us for co- the four coaches and me talking a little bit of Dan Barry Hattrick's hockey, the junior level, the professional level. We'll teach you a little bit about the NAHL as well, which you might not know too much about because the focus is typically been on the FPHL, but we will get you caught up to speed on what some of those potential D1 and maybe even NHL players have coming up. As we introduce the panel from left to right, this is Matt Voigt. He's been with the organization for five years, director of goaltending, the head coach for the NA3HL, Dan Barry Hattricks, and also an assistant coach on the FPHL team. As we make our way across the table, There's head coach Billy McCreary. He's the director of player operations and hockey operations for the Danbury Hattricks. Head coach for the Danbury Hattricks and general manager. What title does he he not hold for this Hattricks team at this point? As we keep going, there's Tyler Noseworthy. He is the general manager for the NA3HL team. He's also an assistant coach for the NAHL team and a uh, crucial part for the junior development as this program continues to build further and further and our final coach all the way on the end is Patrick Stefan the head coach and general manager of the Knoll Danbury Hattricks so that's the panel tonight a lot of great hockey minds and we're going to pick their brains a little bit starting on the right side of the table as we discuss the NAHL the North American Hockey League it's a junior hockey league and with the Danbury Hattricks, the focus has tended to be more on the Federal Prospects Hockey League, the professionals. But we'll start with Patrick. The Null. this is a junior league. Some of our fans might not even know what that is or w- w- how old the players are or where they're projected to go. So just kind of bring us in and fill the fans in on what the NAHL is and where the players are coming from. Yeah, no, the NHL is the essentially the second best uh, junior uh, hockey league in the U.S. Uh, the age of the players uh, are anything anywhere between uh, about 17 to 20. Um, you know, I'm sure the goals for for you know many of these kids are first and most to get a D1 scholarship uh, in the college, and uh, beyond that, you know, obviously I'm assuming that uh, every goal of uh, any young player is to, to make it the National Hockey League and play at the highest level. Uh, there has been a players uh, in the past, this year, last year, over the last few years, uh, actually drafted the, the National Hockey League from this league. Uh, so I think the league is getting some recognition that uh, there's some some good talent uh, in this league. Uh, for us in, in Danbury, obviously, we would like to see you know, our group and our team uh, to get to that point that you have players uh, you know, getting commitments to the D1 schools, uh, potentially be drafted to National Hockey League, um, you know, or, you know, just make it uh, at the pro level at some point, um, you know, after they are done with, uh, with, their, with their schools. Yeah, and uh, we'll shift over to Tyler a little bit on this. You were a player for the professional Danbury Hattricks team, the FPHL, for a little while. Now you stayed in the coaching ranks. You were talking to me earlier a little bit about the goals of this team. Last year, was was a tough year all around not much winning this year you guys came in kind of revamped some things and have focused on a couple specific goals to get this team to where it wants to be what are those specific goals moving forward yeah i mean obviously last year um it was a bit of a tough year for us um we did we did feel like we we kind of finished on the on the right note starting to get some of those those habits that we we preach every day um, and that definitely did carry over to, to our pr- approach this year. Um, you know, we, we do have short-term goals this year. I mean, we had six wins last year. We're trying to get at least 20 this year and then a playoff spot the following year. So, you know, we, we certainly think those things are attainable for our group. Um, we, we have kind of gone into a little bit of a younger direction with, with that kind of being the forefront of the focus. Um, but we, we also feel like those young guys are the right players and, and they bring, uh, you know, they bring the style of play that, that ultimately we want on the ice. Um, so I think really the sky, the sky's the limit for the group. It's young, but I think we're moving in the right direction. 
And with these guys, as we've mentioned, they have a chance to go play D1 at the college level. They also have a chance to be drafted in the NHL. This is some really competitive hockey, skilled hockey, fast hockey, a little bit different than the Fed League, where it's a little bit more physical and there's more emphasis. Well, now they're pushing a little bit away from the fighting, but it's a little bit of a different game, right? It's a little more skilled game. And when the when the federal team is on the road, you guys tend to be at home and those games are open to the public. They can come in and watch those games and uh, and watch these players. So I guess what what's the pitch to get these guys in here and watching hockey in the city of Danbury every weekend? Yeah, I mean, I for, you know, it's uh, right now we, we've got one uh, division one commitment in our uh, in our room. But, you know, any given night, Friday, Saturday night, like like to your point, if the pro guys are away, um, you know, the incoming team, they could have five, six, seven, eight, nine division mm-hmm. one commitments. Um, I think there's actually a team with nine in our division. So um, the product is, is, is very high end. Um, and ultimately it's, you know, it's on us as, as an organization to kind of educate the community where, where maybe they, they might not know, you know, exactly what, what goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that, that we got to kind of take some of that on our, on our plates as well. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'd, like to, I'd like to add something to that as well. Like, um, you know, there's a culture here, obviously. You know, mm-hmm. there's, the, there's the trashers and, and Dumber is a town and hockey town that, you know, it, it's it's a tough team to play against. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's you know, it's skill. It, it's tough. Like, we want to be a team that is fast, is younger, um, skill, but we don't want to be just a skilled team that is get pushed around. Like, you know, we like to play some tough, me for hockey, we like to be the team who is known to be hard to play against. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if the fan comes into our building, you know, we like to play offense. We like to be a tough team. Mm-hmm. You know, we like to add some skill, which we did this year. And then with the youth level, you know, obviously helps that, you know. So, like, we, we're not trying to be a, a completely different team that is the culture has been set. Mm-hmm. You know, there's obviously difference between the the fed team and our team obviously the kids are younger a little bit different um you know different level and different where they are you know in their careers but um you know like i said i mean the culture has been set here we like to kind of be even in that you know to be a team who is known and teams come in like hey we're gonna play dumber it's gonna be tough Mm -hmm. you know but have that youthful hit the skill set you know and, and and obviously score some goals and play some offense essentially for the fans and you mentioned that you guys have the one college recruit. You guys have went up against teams that have 10, 12 college recruits on their roster, and you've beaten them this year. What's the message in the locker room? How do you get these guys going up against, you know, these these other teams that have more recruits, but you guys just go in there and you win games against teams that, when you look at it on paper, you're not – projected to beat those teams well, what's that message i think sometimes it's the easiest motivation right yep. <clears throat> you go against competition that is it's on the paper is untouchable and right i mean bunch of d1 commitments and the players are really really good on the paper you know you go in there like essentially like yeah you are not in that position you want to be in that position or let's see what we can do here and see how you match up and essentially i think that's <laughs> that's sometimes the easiest motivation you know hey let's match up over here so what we got here there's lots of Lots of firepower in the in the boys over there. You know how they are motivated to play against these players that they would like to get that commitment. You know, okay, do I'm good enough? Okay, I can I, I can be good enough when I'm you know essentially the same player, maybe even better. This player, mm-hmm. that's that's essentially how we go about it. And there's not much to be said really. I mean, that's these players are smart kids. Yeah. You know, and we play these teams. And like you mentioned, like I mean, you know, most of these teams have quite a few commitments, the D ones, and 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 for us, we would like to get there. And we also remind the players, like, you want to get there, you know, you got to, you know, like I say, you know, you, you want to be the best, you got to be the best. And, you know, obviously they got the commitments on the, on, the, on the paper. Okay, let's see what we can do here. Yeah, so the NAHL team keeps on chugging along, trying to get commits, trying to just develop these guys. Before we shift into the goaltending aspect of things with Matt Vordy, and also he coaches the head coach of the NA3HL team as well, and then we'll shift to the professional hockey side of things. With the all, just trying to get the fans more engaged and more involved in the team and just an understanding, because I think sometimes things intertwine a little bit where people are a little bit confused on the separation between the two teams and the two levels of play. Um, 
so that's that's really the main goal of these coaches panels is to get some recognition out and to get some knowledge on what what the differences are between these two teams and how you can enjoy both of these 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 teams and uh, and be a fan of both of them, the Fed team and the Null team as we move forward into the season and we progress with these young guys really gaining some valuable experience, which you've said, Nosy, off off camera has been uh, has been something that's led to success as of late for you guys started off where you had some of the older guys coming back from last year, moved some of that out, got a lot younger and have actually had some success with that. How is that little transition mid season turned some things around for you guys? Well, a lot of times, um, you know, a change of scenery for a young player might be, might be just what they need. Um, same thing goes for, for older guys, right? If they're, um, you know, if they're looking for more of a, of a playoff push and then they're, they're in their last season, um, you know, you always want to make sure that you're doing right by them. But then, mm-hmm. you know, the, the younger guys that are coming in, maybe they weren't getting a ton of opportunity, mm-hmm. um, putting them in, in spots where they can have success. Um, and obviously with us having a young team, you know, we've got a lot of freedom to kind of play with some things and, and give some guys some opportunities that maybe they might not have had before coming here. Um, so, I, I mean, we're, we're seeing – we're, we're kind of reaping that reward right now. Um, a lot of guys that were kind of, you know, you don't really want to call it scraps, but, but guys that were just kind of fell into our laps and a couple trades that we had to make. And, you know, there are top guys now and it's just, it's the opportunity that you provide. And, and I guess the, the coaching that goes with it. Right. And, and, you know, our goal over here, me and Tyler, I mean, it's, it's obviously developing these players, but you know, we have this sign in there and just talk to the kids about it. They're changing their narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, and now league has been known for to be the older league. Uh, you know, obviously we can go a couple of different routes. Uh, we decided to go the younger route uh, to give opportunity to some of the young guys that maybe they don't get somewhere else, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. They are very motivated, right? They are youthful. And, you know, there is lots of time with these younger kids. There's lots of motivation because they have many years still ahead of them. Like the door is not closing anytime soon. So there's lots of work to be done. And they know that. And they're just looking for a good opportunity for coaching. And this can be a place, and obviously it showed this year that, you know, we, yeah, we're a place, we got a lot younger. I think we're one of the youngest teams in the league. And, you know, the results are in the way that you can see some of these kids developing, getting better, and essentially helping us to win the hockey games. And we talk about the fan base, but I'm just saying, you know, come to our games and watch our games. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I mean, I think the best way you learn about it, not just through, you know, media information, just come check it out and then see what it looks like, you know, and see what you think. You know, I mean, the, are there fights in there? Yes. Is the scraps in there? Yes. Is it skillful? Is it goals there? Yes. You know, I, I think that's, I guess, the best way to go about it, you know, in the way that come check it out, come see it, you know, and see what you think of it. Well, you got a great opportunity to watch it this weekend. Hattricks are at home for two games against New Hampshire. First game is on Friday night at 7 o'clock. You can buy tickets um, through DanburyHattricks.com right to the ticket spot. It will take you right to Tixer. Then you got a double header actually on Saturday. You got a game of three and a game at seven. And that happens quite a bit. I mentioned the Fed team sometimes goes on the road and the Null is home. A lot of the times it's a three o'clock puck drop, seven o'clock following that. So you can have a full day of hockey inside the Danbury Ice Arena on a Saturday, a Sunday, whatever it may be. There's a lot of hockey to watch, skilled, young, and exciting for the NAHL side. We'll shift over to Matt Voidy, who I mentioned five years with the organization, kind of has his hands in every jar with all these different teams. Goaltending route, though, the Hattricks, especially the Fed team, has had a couple goalies of note recently that are now up in the ranks into affiliated hockey. You know, what's what's kind of the role that you're playing with their development and kind of the practicing? And w- what are you trying to drill down with these goalies from the pro standpoint and even and the younger development. I think from the pro standpoint, it's um, when they come in, if they're rookies, obviously just making that adjustment, especially in the lifestyle to being a pro, Um, especially as a goalie, especially in this league, it's very difficult because it is a very long season. You don't get many breaks. Mm -hmm. Um, The standard at which you're, you're measured at is much more harsher than where they've been, whether it's college or junior. You know, I mean, you got to get the job done. And if you don't, then we're going to find somebody else. Um, fortunately, we've been blessed to have some really good goalies from the time I've been here. So um, 
that learning curve is very small. Um, I fortunately, you know, last year I knew Brian Wilson previously to him being here, so that relationship was was a little bit easier to go about. But you know, you look at Tom McGuckin, like I didn't really know when he came in, had a good framework, had to work through it a little bit, and then you know took off with it. You know, Dylan Kelly now I think he's in the coast. He's a regular starter in the coast. Like when he came in, you know, he had some some things he had to work on and he's to his credit he's worked on he got to the ahl and now he's there and Mm -hmm. you know um willie and you know even frankie got called up to the sp in the coast this year like it if you get good people it's really easy and what the best thing i can say about them is they're they're some of the best people i've worked with you know just not a lot of ego just want to get better you know they they're, they're very stable emotionally they're not up and down which can happen especially when you're breaking into pro and you see all this, there's all this new stuff, right? Mm-hmm. All this new thinking and all this new kind of play. And, um, but when you have the right people, it's, it's really easy and really enjoyable. And for you, what are some of the differences? Because you're with the pro guys as an assistant coach. Yep. So you, and then, but you're with the young guys as a head coach, kind of leading <laughs> some of these young kids who yeah. I'm in the building every day. We see them kind of walking around, joking around. It's a little bit of a different situation right there. Some of them are away from their families, living, um, living yeah. with some other host families and billet families. So it's just like a different situation. So what are some of the differences there dealing with the two, two types of ages and, and groups? It's an interesting experience. Um, definitely learning a lot being in that kind of in between world. And I think, uh, you know, one of our players helped us out on the bench in, in, in Binghamton over the break. And he's like, wow, you're a completely different coach of the pro guys. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> they're 25, 30 years old. Like you guys are 16, you know, 17 to 20 years old. And, yeah. you know, it's, I, you know, they're learning how to play, you know, mm-hmm. so it's a much different standard. It's a, I think sometimes with younger men, especially you have to be, a little bit tougher and crack the whip a little bit more and you know probably be on the details a little bit more with them just because they don't know and they don't understand the magnitude of not hitting a detail mm-hmm. and not you know bringing the right energy to the rink every day whereas the pro guys they understand it they've been through it they've been through long seasons and sometimes with them they just need a little bit more encouragement you know there's definitely times where you gotta you gotta snap on them mm-hmm. you know um you know we've both done that um, but for the most part, it's more little details, little adjustments, making sure they're in the right headspace. You know, it's, it's more about perf- performance at that, at, at that, at least at our level, it is development too, but it's more about performance, getting them ready to perform. And we're the younger guys, a little bit more about development and teaching them how to play. Gotcha. And Billy, you've been an advocate really to get the development part, the junior part really integrated with the FPHL as well. Get the Danbury hat tricks to be an organization that's not just in the FPHL, but also is a pipeline and, and a place where development happens. And, and you're really big into hockey development. So uh, you, you seem, you know, everyone might know you from being the man on the bench and, and you know, have an island in one hand and, and you kind of trotting around the Danbury Ice Arena. Um, but kind of what's your day to day with the organization in terms of, how are you spreading yourself out to all these different teams? I mean, I got to tell you, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the building. And, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned it, just being an advocate for everybody. And uh, obviously the, the the pro game here in Danbury has a has a foundation that uh, is almost unmatched. And, uh, you know, when we made a commitment to bring the North American Hockey League here, uh, you know, I played in that league. I was a product of that league. Um, you know, I, I was able to go to college from that league. And the the growth that I got from those two years in the North American Hockey League was greater than, than you know, the four years I spent at NCAA. It was greater than, than the experience I had in minor pro. So, you know, just really wanted to, to commit to uh, the development of the game and building the foundation and, you know, growing our organization. It's great having a pro team here. It's exciting. It's uh, it's what everybody wants to see. But at the end of the day, there's a lot more hockey out there. And like these guys have touched on, you know, that North American Hockey League, that that brand of hockey is some of the most exciting hockey you're ever going to watch. And 
Uh, you know, you mentioned Isla when, when she was being born, you know, she was born two months early and I was in the hospital, uh, with my fiance kind of working through everything. And, uh, I turned on the, turned on the game fast hockey back then to, to kind of check up on what was going on. And, you know, there's just a line brawl, five on five <laughs> brawl going on against Maine. And, um, you know, you don't see that at the federal hockey league level. Right. And everybody talks about, um, you know, the Amesbury's of the world and the tough guys around the league and Schmidt and the guys that live around the FPHL. But, you know, the NHL is just a fast physical brand of hockey. These are the guys that are going to be the future of this game. And we really want to expose our local community to that brand of hockey. And we also want to offer, you know, local kids around here that are within an hour uh, of Danbury, the opportunity where they don't have to move to the West coast or go to Canada to play hockey and develop and be a division one hockey player. They can, you know, do it in their backyard. Um, you know, you look at a kid like Logan Nickerson's been here for three years uh, from about 45 minutes down the road. Right. Um, you know, there's stories like that all across the board. So we want to just continue to build on that, but it's a bit of a process. Uh, we've all been a part of that process. You know, these guys are doing a fantastic job, you know, sticking with that process and building upon what we've done in the past. And, uh, yeah, we just want to continue to to be an advocate for the game at all levels, be the best we can be at all levels. And ultimately, um, you know, like we mentioned, when the pro guys aren't here on a Friday and Saturday night, you know, the NA guys are here and we want to do that for our community, too. It's an exciting brand of hockey and we want everybody to just be in the Danbury Ice Arena enjoying, uh, you know, that family atmosphere as much as they can. And as Voidy touched on, with the younger guys, it seems like it's a little bit more about the details when you're going over some film. And I, I see you guys all the time in the office kind of going over some stuff with different units and things. So kind of bring the fans into a video session. And what are the specific things you're looking at with those junior guys in terms of getting better? And then I guess we'll ask Billy the same thing about the pro guys and if we'll see if there's any bit of a difference. It is hockey at the end of the day, right? So you're looking at the, the uh, you know, the structure and things like that. But um, what are you looking at specifically in those? Oh, I, I think both me and Tyler are, are pretty big on, on the visual aspect of the game. I think that's, in, in some ways, that's the best way you can learn. I think the game is so fast. Uh, and these kids, you know, have access to so many different things. Um, and I think the visual learning, you know, for these kids can come really handy. Uh, I think there is a fine balance between not overdoing it because if you throw too much information at them, you know, you can get them lost. You still want them to feel free and develop their, you know, kind of reactionary thing that, you know, they can just go and play and react to things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be just robotic, you know, so, you know, we trying to be not too systematic. Uh, we try to maybe do some individual stuff with them in regards to their specific needs, uh, what they need in the video. And there is also, you know, kind of the balance between, you know, we are getting ready for the weekend for the game. So there's a video, you know, on the opposition who we go play against. Uh, so they have some, you know, a little bit of a habits and a little bit of things to give them a little bit of an edge on the, on the opposition. And, and, but we are more, I guess, focused on, you know, our team, our kids, our players, and specifically because we are a younger team. So these kids coming, you know, that there is a lot of things to learn. They can learn a lot. They, they can develop a lot. So we're trying to really influence, um, you know, on the, on the mode of individual things uh, to be more specific and also to kind of play the way we want to play in some ways. I mean, we talk about, the, you know, how we want to play, we want to play fast, we want to play heavy, you know, we want to mm -hmm. play, you know, with, with some skill and, and, and youth. And I, I guess the best way to go about it is that, yeah, you want to play that way, but make sure you understand what it looks like, you know, and that's, I think, through the video to show them, you know, what it, what it feels like, what it looks like, you know, so get a pretty good understanding and very clear message. Just to just to add on to that, yeah. there um, we we've tried a couple of things that are uh, a little bit outside the box with regards to video too. Because I mean, you know, they're sixteen to twenty years old. It's tough to kind of keep them fully engaged all yep. the time. But um, you know, we we started doing things like we would um, we would provide video of the opposing team's penalty kill, and we'd have a power play unit get together and analyze video on their own, mm -hmm. so that it's not just us providing information. Um, when they, you know, when they put the work in and, and, and they find habits and they pick things out from the other team, it, it makes us, makes it a lot easier for us to address those, those holes, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so we found that that's a, a pretty effective way to keep them engaged in video, which can sometimes get a little bit lull, but to, to, uh, Patrick's point there, um, you know, you, you definitely want to be cautious of overdoing it, but 
we found that getting them involved is a really good part of the process. Yeah, and, uh, Voidy, I see you all the time on the computer looking at video, <laughs> the, especially last weekend after that first game in Binghamton. I uh, did see you um, looking at the film and, and talking to some of the guys. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess just touch on it from the pro standpoint of, of what you're looking at with those guys. I mean, to their point where they're, they're you know, they're getting their players to break down the, the power play on their own. Some of these guys will just, will talk during video sessions. So our video sessions are a little bit more interactive with the players and coaches um, than with the younger kids in general, right? So, you know, some of these guys have been, been around a long time and they, they know what they're looking at. For our league, it, you know, we see a lot of these teams at the same time. I think, you know, a lot of the same teams a lot, right? So, like, we're playing Binghamton, like, 17 times. We can't know what they're going to do, right? It's more like a refresher, like, hey, here's their power play breakout. Here's their PK. You know, here's maybe something that, you know, they want to do on a face-off, you know. Um, there's not a lot of mystery or a lot of, like, gap between, you know, the last time we played a team and when we play them again, like, you know, with Watertown this weekend, you know, we'll probably do video tomorrow and or Friday. Um, and it'll just be basically a refresher of what what they do on their PP and their PK and, you know, any new face-off plays if they have them, you know, just to, so the guys are aware. Gotcha. And, Billy, I'm assuming it's very similar with uh, with, with those answers of what, what you're looking at, specifically moving forward with, with some of that fil- film stuff. Um, I just kind of want to transition a little bit to some of the things that are happening. Apologies for the uh, the volume that's a little loud in there. Are we all right there? Lower that up, Calvin, if we can. Calvin Savoyer, our brilliant producer and director and engineer today, and always with the broadcast, is we'll charge forward and as he kind of fix, fixes that a little bit. Um, we kind of talk, let's talk a little bit about the FBHL and kind of stuff that's going around in the league. And, and as of, as of recently, of course, last year was an un- unbelievable year. 10 losses, won the championship for the first time in Hattrick's history, just adding to Dan Barry hockey history as a whole. This year was more up and down in the beginning than kind of, kind of hit a stride over the last couple of weeks. Um, did end up splitting this weekend series with Binghamton, and now you have Watertown coming in here. But there was an incident that occurred on Saturday in Binghamton where Nick Nicola was skating up the ice, um, had been um, roughed up, and then um, was at center and had been jumped and was involved in a fight. And then Chase Harwell was near the bench, not on the bench yet, was going for a change, never got on the bench, and then went to protect his teammate, Dina Cola. So, as a result, Harwell was given a six-game suspension for leaving the bench. You were given a three-game suspension due to the FPHL's new rules that state if a player is suspended for two or more games, the coach must be suspended by half of that suspension. Just your thoughts on the incident itself and maybe even touching up on the new rules from the FPHL. Well, that's a great question. I thought uh, the incident was pretty unfortunate. I thought kind of the, the timing of it and where it was in, in the middle of a line change, it kind of put our guys in a little bit of a precarious position. And, you know, I don't think there was really any ill will uh, for anybody out there to kind of jump a bench and, you know, go at anyone. Um, but, you know, listen, the game of hockey, it's fast, it's physical and things happen. And, you know, Dino was playing a good, hard game. He was kind of getting under their skin. And, um, you know, one of their guys tried to just take some liberties on him. And, you know, again, Danbury hockey, no matter what level, we're going to protect each other. Um, you know, we talked about it after the game. And, and you look at the situation and not that this is something you need to break down on video, but, you know, we're down four to two uh, with about six minutes to, to go or so in the second period. Um, you know, if we can find a way to get on a power play and, and score a power play goal and make it 4-3 going into the third, you know, as coaches, that's that's kind of our message, right? Let's get on the power play and, and let's get to work here. So, 
we always want to defend each other. Um, we always want to stick up for each other and stick up for our guys. Um, you know, we also have to learn as the season goes on and adapt as the season goes on, because if that's, you know, if that's game one in the playoffs, uh, you're probably letting Dino take a couple punches off the top of the head and you're taking a five minute major power play uh, going into the last five minutes or so of the second period. Right. So, you know, it's a game of mistakes. It's not the mistake that defines the player or the person. It's how you make up for that mistake. So like we talk about video, talk about uh, development, you know, that's, that's what all of these levels are. So a bit of an unfortunate incident, but we're going to continue to work through it as a team and uh, you know, we'll keep going. Yeah. There have been some other incidents around the league where players were suspended for more than two games. Coaches were not handed out any suspensions due to the fact that the coach had no control over the situation. Um, do you wish you jumped on Chase before he stormed after the player? Or did you have like a rope, a lasso or something to pull him back in? Um, you yeah, know, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure how you were going to handle that one. Yeah, go-go gadget arms, I guess. But uh, no, again, it's just all about the it's about the messaging. And, you know, players have to learn to adjust to each moment, each situation. Um, you know, and again, as, as tough as we want to play and we want to defend each other, you know, we have to understand the rules and the league is really trying to crack down on things like that. So we have to make an adjustment. Like I've, I've spent a long time in this game and I've had to adjust as a player two or three times. I've had to adjust as a coach a couple of times. And if you're not willing to adjust, the game's probably going to pass you by. So um, you don't always have to agree with the rules. Uh, you know, I don't want to be somebody who tries to skirt the rules and, and try to, you know, have nosy or voidy become the head coach. Like we're just going to keep going business as usual, whether the rules are changing or not. Um, you know, we have to find a way to be successful within whatever league with within whatever rule set is uh, given to us. You have been the head coach yeah. for a game or two so this season, not due to any suspensions. And that will be, most likely upcoming, you'll be the head coach for the next couple of games uh, if there is no um, withdrawal of that suspension. Or... We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We will see what happens with the ruling on that. But uh, when you took over and you were the head coach for the pro team, what was that like? Um... <laughs> it was coming I mean, after a be... game in Watertown that was that was a 7-2 loss and you came back home for two. Perfectly honest, brutally honest. It was a little bit like the substitute teachers. And everyone wanted to have a say and everyone to do this and do that. And I had to snap at a couple of people. Um, and then we came out and <laughs> we, we took a penalty right off the beginning because one of our guys didn't get off on time. So the warm-ups and now we're down two. And I would hold about it. So I got down to the bench. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and then we left three goals right in a row and I had to call a timeout and smart just, timeout. Just, it worked. Just light them on fire. Yeah, it did, it did work. I, I didn't know if it was going to work. I just, I wanted to just yell at them. Um, we were, it, we worked. Thought... it worked. We came back. It was one of our bigger wins. And then the next night in, in bingo, you know, the, the boys were a little bit more settled. Uh, we did go down, but we were able to come back, um, a lot less yelling, a little bit less emotion for me and a little bit more from them. And, you know, I think that was a really good weekend for the boys to see, Hey, like we've got it. We can do this against these teams. We, don't, we hadn't beaten bingo up until that point. Yeah. It had been a tough stretch, lost six of the first seven against them. Yeah. And then that started sort of the comeback victories against Binghamton. That has led to this um, little stretch against the top team in the empire where you guys are crawling your way back up in terms of points and you're playing 18 times this season. So, uh, so there's a lot more opportunity over the next couple of months to play Binghamton, and that really did spark it. after the slow 3 nothing start. That definitely sparked some things. You mentioned your name, Nosy, as a potential as uh, would uh, maybe have to step up in a coaching capacity. Know that maybe you'd throw on the skates, too, if you really had to. What's your mindset? Are you, are you, are you going into the the adult hockey league world now, or are you, you're still itching to play at the pro, at the pro league? I'm ready to do anything. <laughs> Absolutely anything. Play a coach. Let's go. What if there was a line brawl in the Nall again? Like there was, like there was uh last year. Yeah. Are you getting into it with a coach? We saw, I saw a video that uh, Billy actually showed me from a couple of years ago where some coaches got into it. Would you be the first no. uh, I crossing mean... the bench? I don't know. I don't know about that. You, you, you want to try to keep it as professional as possible. But the one thing that I will never allow to happen is for 
you know, an unsafe environment for my players. So if, if there's a coach on the other bench that might be doing something that, you know, is a little bit ill willed towards a, a junior age player at that point, my, 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 uh, I, I'd be pretty much uh, all in at that point. So Billy, he's ready to go whenever you're ready. Uh, if you need him, I mean, there's been, there's been times where the, the, the fed team has been shorthanded. Nosy was, uh, Knows he was very gracious last year about making my job pretty easy. Yeah, uh, you know, towards the end of the year, kind of ran the forwards. I think he even had the power play for a little bit. And so it was, uh, yeah, first time in my career, I kind of got to just uh, step back and oversee some things and manage some energy levels. And, uh, yeah, it was a blessing, that's for sure. Gotcha. And, Patrick, you played in the NHL. That's obviously the, the top of the top, the highest level of professional hockey the guys that you're coaching now, some of them have dreams to play in the NHL. That's their end goal. What was that experience like playing against the best players in the world? Well, I mean, it's it's the experience. I think it's like you said. I mean, it's, it's a dream of, I think, any hockey player, right? I mean, to get to that level, to reach that level, uh, to play at that level. I mean, you know, I was I was a young kid coming out of Czech. I didn't really have too much access to really much hockey on TV, especially in the National Hockey League. I mean, I have some idol as, you know, Yarmy Yager, Dominic Hasek, just icons in Czech that you kind of just follow, you know, when they were, you know, younger and, and playing for the national team. Um, you know, so for me, like a national hockey was more true, just, you know, when these guys got there to just watch, you know, what it looks like. And, and, and you know, so it was it was national hockey, but it was more of the icons of, in Czech, like, like Yager and Hasek. Just watch those guys grow up, you know, how they, you know, went about things. And then, you know, when they obviously got there, the National Hockey, what they did. Um, I mean, it's a special league, obviously. It's the best in the best. Uh, you know, what I what I got about that is that I, I think what's the most fun about it is you have the best players. But I always said, we thought these guys, you know, we coach, you know, these younger kids is that, yeah, you can look at his skill set. You can look at lots of different things and talent. But I think the work ethic and the compete in those games. So you have the best players, you know, compete, you know, that that level. And I think that's always, you know, for us a good kind of teaching tools that, you know, you want to get better, you got to put the work in. You know, I mean, these guys are the best in the world and look at the work they put in, you know. So that's kind of, I guess, in the way what I can bring it, but I, I experienced that, you know, when I was there, I've seen it personally, you know, with these guys and some of these best players in the world, you know, how, how hard they work and how much extra they do and, and they are the best, you know, so there's a reason they kind of goes hand to hand. So, so it's, it's, you know, I try to kind of bring that into this, you know, youthful and, and younger kids that, you know, to show them that, you know, what it looks like, what it feels like, but uh, more importantly, like, you know, you want to make it somewhere, you want to get the Devon scholarship, you want to get all these things. Okay. And all this, you do, you put the work in for two and a half, three hours when you come to the rink, what we assign for you, like what you do outside of it. Mm -hmm. That, I think that's what makes a difference. And, and if you already be a, me and Tyler both seen, obviously some, I think dramatic, you know, progress in some of these youth and some of these younger guys that now we come into the ring and we get that pretty early. And there are a couple of guys there, you know, already working out and training, you know, and they are, you know, younger kids, mm -hmm. uh, 17 year old, you know, 18 year old kids. Like that's for me and, and for us, that's, that's a little bit of a proud there. Like, mm -hmm. okay, they get in the message, they put in the work in and, you know, interesting enough. I mean, you see that. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you know, you feel better about your game. You help the team because I always say like you develop the players, players develop, you win hockey games. You know, that's kind of been, we kind of step forward here to see, to see some of these progresses some of these younger kids to taking these steps. But not just by us coaching them, but mm -hmm. them taking accountability and, and putting the extra work in. You probably get this question asked a lot. Who is the best player you ever played with and against? <laughs> Actually, it's pretty easy for me. I mean, the best player I ever played with was uh, Mariano Hossa. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the chance to play with him for two years in Atlanta. And we got to play on the same line for about a season. We become pretty good friends. Um, and, and I was a centerman. He was a winger. The way he played the game, uh, he was fast, physical, uh, very smart, very skilled. Like, I mean, that was he was such an all-around game and such a great teammate. Like, I, it made my job so much easier. So that was a player, you know, I, I play with. And against uh, Peter Forsberg. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, 
like for me, <laughs> when I was on the ice against him, like, you know, it, I don't want to say fear, but the the balance between his, his skill set and the toughness, like, I, I think that's that's hard to teach, you know, because he was not just very gifted, very talented, like he was tough, you know, tough to get off his puck. He was physical, you know, so I think that, you know, as a player, you know, you play against a player like that. I mean, yeah, so that was, that was kind of my, you know, my, my, my no go to, you know, when I was on dice, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, I, I got, I got Peter on dice against me. So. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. We're talking about the NHL and talk a little bit below that right into affiliated hockey. Another former Dan Barry hat trick makes the jump to the ECHL in Daniel Amesbury. And that pipeline continues to grow. It's unbelievable how many Dan Barry hat tricks are now playing, even in the SPHL, ECHL, um, and for a lot of these pro guys, some of it stops right there at the FPHL, right? They'll play with the hat tricks, they'll float around that league, and that's it. And they'll play great hockey and put up big numbers. But your teams and the way you've brought some guys in, maybe a little bit younger, who have jumped. You look at a guy like Marsha San, who had the biggest goal in hat tricks history, right? And now he's playing up at the at the next level. How? What does that make you feel when you see some of your guys that you were coaching make the next jump and you know, what does it show about this Danbury Hattricks organization? Uh, I mean, listen, the wins are great. The championships are phenomenal. Those, those are memories you, uh, you can't replace, but you know, when you get to see uh, players reap the success of um, their efforts, you know, really uh, there, there's just nothing like it. You know, for me, I got into coaching to, to provide players a, a better opportunity than I had in the game. And, you know, so I spent most of my career in the SPHL and ended it in the Fed. And, uh, you know, so when guys have the opportunity to play at higher levels than I did, I mean, that's that's what it's all about for me. These guys are chasing their dreams. We're all chasing our dreams. We all, you know, want we still have that boyhood, want to work in the NHL, play in the NHL, whatever mm -hmm. that is. So, you know, to see these guys chase their dreams and be successful within it, you know, not a lot of guys come out of the Fed and and have the success that that our guys have had in the, in the east coast hockey league and and even beyond um so it's uh it's pretty special to see it's special to be a part of and certainly something that the organization can hang their hat on do some of these d1 commit guys these goaltenders got one on an all team going to princeton do they amaze you a little bit sometimes by how talented they are, what skills they show off, maybe a paddle save moving from left to right, something that you haven't seen, like they pull out something out of their sleeve, or is it you've seen it all? I mean, you've been in hockey. You're a hockey guy here, so you might have seen it all. I'm more impressed by their work ethic and how they bring gotcha. themselves to the rank. Like, you know, I think the kid we just brought up first, and it's a pretty good example of that. It doesn't say a lot shows up, works his butt off, you know, and is very low maintenance. And nowadays, I mean, with the goalies in general, <laughs> like, like that's a big uh, thing that impresses me, to be honest. I'm more impressed by that. I mean, the paddle saves, all that stuff, that's going to come. And, you know, you can turn your TV and, to be honest, watch that. But yeah. I think... I think when you get a kid who's not quite where maybe, you know, first and is right now, and you see them grow into that kind of player where they're able to be tougher and they're able to be more mentally tougher as well as physically tougher and, and, and learn the position and, and really be a leader on the team. That's where you get impressed because that is not easy to do mm -hmm. for anybody. That was one of the neatest parts about, you know, Marchy, like you talked about, right? I mean, he got cut from Binghamton, um, you know, cut from Huntsville where I played in the SPHL then cut from Binghamton then came to us. And he really had to grow into the player that, that he is now. And, you know, I think if you, if you were able to ask Marchy, he'd tell you it took some time and some growing pains and, uh, you know, some, some tough words from the coaching staff every now and again, but to his commitment or to his credit, he made the commitment and, you know, look where he is now. Right. So, to Voice's point, when you see the kids, you know, really buy in and um, and grow into the players that we know that they can be, uh, it's it's pretty special. And it's pretty cool how there's growth in both of the teams, right? Obviously, there's going to be growth in building with the young, young guys in the NAHL and the NA3HL, but 
at the FPHL, you still have young enough guys, right? There's guys who are my age, around 21, 22. You also have the veteran guys, like a Johnny Ruiz, who's 29, and Amesbury was 33, and we had a 39-year-old defenseman suiting up this year, Jim Jensen, who uh, who was great in the limited action he was in there. But there's just a different range in that league, which is just unique um, altogether. We actually have some fan questions coming in. Now, we will do a couple more of these coaches panels as the season goes on. Want to just continue to update you guys on both organizations and uh, and things like that. You can submit your questions. We'll have an area for you to submit your questions before the show. This, of course, our first one here at TK's American Cafe. So um, some growing pains. Great time, though. We're, we're definitely enjoying it. But we got a question here for Billy and then whoever else would like to join in. Who is uh, who in the history of the federal hockey league would you consider the greatest individual player the greatest individual player in the history of the federal hockey league yep wow did this question come from her um <laughs> it, it it says question submission for billy mccreary <laughs> and yes it is from herm sorcher's yeah, phone he wants yeah. to put me on the spot yeah um, i would say uh billy mccreary but that's no i'm just kidding go no. ahead <laughs> I don't know. I would, um, geez, there's been some pretty good players. I mean, there's been some NHL guys that have played in this league. Um, but I don't know. I'm going to have to stick close to home, and I'll go with the uh, the team that I played on, the New Jersey Outlaws. Travis Caulfield was just a goal-scoring machine um, in the Fed, in the SP. He broke records, and he only spent one year in the in the Federal Hockey League, but I think he accounted for probably 30% of our goals. And, wow. Uh, he was a big big piece of our power play and a big piece of why uh, we were able to win the championship in Danbury against Herm Sorcher's team. Yeah, that was uh that one definitely stings for her, for Herm probably. And it he, might, I don't know. You'd have to ask him. We'll see if he sends in another question, he might have a follow-up question on that, but we'll uh, we'll stay tuned on that, but you can submit questions in the chat on the YouTube. We've got that all situated here for future questions anyone else have anything with the uh, fed fed players anyone that comes to mind best of all time i mean pierre dagenet it's yeah. hard not to to mention his name but some teacher. great players great players in the league some great players on the hat tricks right now um you know maybe i guess if we talk danbury hat tricks history and danbury hockey history as a whole there are some that are going into the Hall of Fame, the Ring of Honor at the Danbury Arena. That will be in March. We're going to announce that with Alumni Night at the Danbury Arena. So be on the lookout for, for that. Um, some of those players that... Some big that, names. Are yeah, there are some big-time names that, that come to mind. Which one, and this isn't even in terms of skill or the best player, right? The one that should be in the Ring of Honor, anything like that. Who was one of your favorite people to be around that you coached? Nicest guy, so, something that just you really enjoyed, a player that you enjoyed being around. I mean, shoot, I could name any of them that are in the yeah. locker room this year, last year. Um, you know, Johnny Ruiz is just such a treat to come and, and be around in, in the ring. Kyle Gonzalez is always happy to be there. I mean, I remember Brian Wilson his first year, like he'd lose a game three to two in the last minute. And he was just all smiles after the game, mm -hmm. like just a tremendous person. Um, so there's, there's just been a, a ton of them, but you know, a couple of guys that do stick out for me from the past are guys like Nicola Levesque and Phil Bronner. Um, you know, guys that were here in the beginning when the times were tough and, you know, we lost five, six games in a row out of the gate and, you know, they just, they committed to just grinding through what we needed to grind through, uh, as a young team, as a young organization. Uh, and if, if they didn't have that energy there that first year, I, I don't know if, you know, I'd still be sitting here right now. So those guys, uh, they were tremendous leaders, tremendous people, great to have in the room. And I found myself traveling down the rabbit hole today watching 2019 Danbury Hattricks highlights. Casey Bryan on the call for those goals. Don't make me cry. Yeah, that was uh, a lot Special of year. a lot of Phil Bronner on that one for sure. Uh, scoring goals left and right. That was lots of great players in the Hattricks history so far. Final question for everyone, then we'll wrap it up here at TK's. Just goals for the rest of the season. We're about midway through, a little more than that for the season. It's flying by here in 2024 just goals from each and every one of you of how the rest of the season you guys want it to go. And we'll start with Patrick over there. Yeah, I, th I think we have some internal goals in, in regards to some wins and, and some accomplishments here. But I think overall, I think we'd like to see some of those younger guys should take a step here 
you know, towards the, towards the next season and kind of build towards the next season, uh, you know, to be more competitive. And like Daryl mentioned, um, I think our goal moving into the next season would like to be these young guys take a step and then potentially be around a playoff spot and hopefully maybe even get in their playoff spot next year. Nosy? Um, uh, yeah. Try it out there. You all right there, Calvin? You want to lean in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it out. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I got some, some tangible goals. I think I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier there. All right, we'll move. We'll get you switch. We'll switch your headset with Patrick and then we'll, t- we'll go to Billy now and then we'll, uh, we'll bring it back to, uh, to nosy. Yeah. I mean, for us, uh, we want to, we want to accomplish home ice advantage. Um, so whether that's first or second going into the playoffs, obviously we'd like to, uh, we'd like to finish first, but you know, we really have to go after that uh, that second spot, obtain that home ice advantage, and um, you know just win hockey games from there. So it's really about just being the best we can, getting better every day, one percent better every day, focusing on us, and trying to come away with some home ice advantage here going to the playoffs. Forty for goalies and for pro for both <laughs> for for anything you can you can for the, chat yeah whatever you got goalies overall been pretty good, so he's got to keep kicking. Um, wow. A buzzer going off. It's a goalie thing, huh? Jeez. I guess. Um, so goalies just, you know, stay consistent. I think on all three teams, they've been pretty good. Um, just keep improving, essentially. I think on the pro team, you know, I think I'd like to see a little more consistency uh, weekend to weekend, sometimes period to period. Um, and I think we're getting there. I think we're slowly chipping away at that. I think we're going to be a very – Difficult team, scary team come late March, early April. Awesome. Well, the teams are in action this weekend. Oh, wait, Nosy, forgot. We, <laughs> we changed your headset around. Yeah. We got to get your goal. I think, goal we, got, I think we got it now. There you go. Um, so I, uh, you know, we've got some some measurable goals. Um, I know we had kind of discussed this. We'd like to get 20 plus wins, whether it be 20, 21, 22, we think is very attainable for us. Um, and obviously something that you can measure. Um, from a success standpoint, um, we'd like to get uh, probably two Division One commitments before uh, you know it's all said and done. There, which um, there's certainly been some traction as of late, and uh, obviously the the more you you win, the more those uh, the right people are going to be in the stands to to watch our guys. So um, for us, those are two uh, pretty measurable goals to uh, to shoot for. Yeah, and right now the Null team has 11 wins. You said you want to get to 20, and the team is five and five. Over the last 10 games, as for the pro side, they are right on the tails of Motor City for for second place in the Empire Division. Just two points behind them. They are 10, 12, 2 and 2, 44 points. Both teams are in action in Danbury this weekend. Friday night at just an all team. So as we were talking about a great opportunity to watch a new team that you might not even know anything about playing some great hockey. A lot of these guys could be playing D1 hockey. And that's, you know, talk about growing the ladder and developing. It's uh, it's definitely a great atmosphere, and these players are uh, are working really hard and, and very talented. So be there at 7 o'clock on Friday night, and then a doubleheader at the Danbury Arena, 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock, starts with the Null, ends with the Fed, full day of hockey, beers, whatever you want. We have it at the Danbury Arena. Odin's Barbecue, Miguel's Miguel Pereira, my friend at Twister's Ice Cream Cafe. We have it all for you. You just have to go purchase a ticket through Tixer, and then you're there all day. So we'd love to see you for this weekend. A lot of promotions on the Saturday night game, the 27th. It's Scouts Sleep Overnight. So if you're a member of a boys or girls scout group, just sign up on the Danbury Hattricks website. You get a complimentary ticket plus a slew of other uh, complimentary uh, benefits you get to sleep over in the arena you get a skating pass all that great stuff also it's insurance worker appreciation night so if you work in the insurance industry complimentary ticket complimentary beverage danbury hattricks hockey we will see you there on saturday and the kids club i mean how could you not sign up for the kids club if you have a kid 14 and under it's free to join and you get a free ticket on the 27th plus we've got great events coming up maybe one here at tk's Maybe one. We had one at Twister's Ice Cream Cafe. We'll have a skating clinic. Maybe Nosey will lace them up. Billy will be out there. We'll see. 
teach teach your kid how to skate a little bit. We're definitely looking forward to all that. So you can sign up for the Kids Club. The information comes in an email after you sign up. So plenty of opportunity there. We'd love to see you on the 27th. We are at TK's American Cafe. We want to thank TK for having us here for the first ever coaches panel with all four of our coaches. We appreciate them for coming out. 76 amazing wing flavors here. These two guys had a dinner beforehand. I think they approved. Was it solid? It was good. Got to come here. Great place to watch a game. As you can see behind us, you got televisions in each booth. There's no reason why you shouldn't spend a football Sunday here trying any of the wings. Maybe even try the Hatrix flavored wings. They've got them here. So definitely a place to be. All right. That about wraps it up for the Danbury Hatrix panel show with all the coaches. For everyone here, Patrick Stefan, Taylor, uh, Tyler Noseworthy. We got Billy McCreary and Matt Voidy. I'm Doug Latuka saying have a great rest of your night, Hatrix fans. We'll talk again soon, and we hope to see you at the Danbury Arena this weekend. Good night, everyone.